Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how good it is to reflect on what Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, did on our behalf at the cross. Our sins were as red as blood. They were like scarlet. And You have washed them white as snow. Only the death of Your Son in our place could remove the stain of our guilt. And we stand forgiven, we who are in Christ. Lord, Your Son was judged for our sin. And He will one day return and judge the world for its sin. On one hand, we long for that day when Your name will be honored when your son will be vindicated, when all glory will go to you, indeed when every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And yet we anticipate that day with trepidation, knowing that the return of Christ to this earth will come with the worst period of human history. I pray for every soul in this room to be prepared for that day. Would you, by your Holy Spirit here this morning, use your word to make us ready for what is to come? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 6, and we'll be continuing our study of this, the last book of the Bible. We'll begin this morning by asking you, what plans do you have for the future? Do you have investments cooking? Are you making vacation plans? You know, it's good to plan for the future. There are athletes now training to run the 4x100 in the 2032 Olympics in Brisbane. NASA administrators are planning ahead. They want to land a man on Mars by 2040, and they're flying two Artemis missions in preparation. Artemis 2 in 2024 will fly by the moon in return. Artemis 3, they plan to land a man on the moon. And in both missions, they plan to utilize the spacecraft they intend to take to Mars. Arizona Department of Transportation plans ahead. They're working on I-10 right outside here. You may be aware of the Broadway curve. Did you know they are widening I-10 to six general purpose lanes and two high occupancy vehicle lanes in each direction? That's 16 lanes on I-10 between the 60 and I-17. Past the 60, going south, they'll add four general purpose lanes in each direction. They say they'll be done by late 2024. We'll see. We plan for the future, we set goals, we accomplish waypoints, we experience setbacks, we pull ourselves up and we strive forward again. And all of this requires a certain level of predictability in our world, stability, the meeting of basic needs, and the provision of resources to do more than merely survive. Men have made small steps and mankind has made giant leaps. In America, technological advances, military superiority, reliable supply chains have provided for us an enviable level of convenience and comfort and stability and security and predictability in life. Now, in order to take risks, we don't do it for survival. We take risks for recreation. We jump out of airplanes and seek thrills in other words, because of everything that we've benefited from, we, we've been freed up t- to play, to think, to invent, to explore. But you need to know that a disruption is coming, a severe disruption of the way things have been, an interruption of all the plans of man at a worldwide level. It will bring all those plans to a screeching halt. And I'm not talking about the Great Reset or some social revolution. Let's read together the future of this earth. Revelation chapter 6, we'll look at the first eight verses this morning. Then I saw the Lamb 
John records. When he broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to him to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. This section of Scripture records for us the first prophetic events of the book of Revelation that happen on the earth. Chapters 4 and 5 gave us a window into the future in the throne room in heaven when Jesus is given the scroll the book of the seven seals, to be opened. And what follows is the opening of seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and seven bowl judgments in successive order. And this morning, we will look at the first four seals broken. That is, the first four judgments of God unleashed against the earth. And these first four seals are the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, and when these four horsemen appear in this world's future history, the day of man will be up. Mankind has had his run, and God's pent-up response to rebellious humanity will be uncorked. What does this text detail for us? It is the opening four salvos of Jesus' disruption of the day of man. The opening four salvos of Jesus' disruption of the day of the man. This is the beginning of God's judgment against the earth, known as the tribulation period. This is still future for our day. This does not detail historical events. This does not detail cyclical trends in human history. This is literal future history of the world. These first four sealed judgments are dramatized as riders on horses. They are harbingers of worldwide doom and global catastrophe. Four riders on four horses proceed in John's vision to dramatize the future judgments of God. These riders don't necessarily depict individuals. Rather, they portray movements, evil forces. In one sense, these four riders depict the path that mankind would take if mankind was left to its own devices. The effects described in these sealed judgments are global Nothing like these have ever happened yet in history. Let's notice first a rider on a white horse. Look at verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. This first rider, the rider on a white horse, depicts worldwide conquest. It is a picture of a, a globalism, a global unity. Everyone brought under one flag with no borders, no boundaries, no nationalities. And this is encouraging, right? Because borders are the problem. If we do away with all the separate nations, there will be no more conflict. If there is just one people of the earth, they can finally be tied together politically, socially, economically. That will solve the problems of humanity. What do we see in verse 1? 
the lamb breaks one of the seven seals. Here it is, Jesus, the victorious king, the lamb slain, who is the only one worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. Look back at chapter 5. Do you remember John was there witnessing this scene and the question went out in heaven, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Revelation 5, 3 says, No one in heaven, no one on the earth, no one under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly, says John, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. This is the great crisis. If the rebellious world just keeps spinning the way it is, That's not good news. Who's going to usher in God's judgment? And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. John, of course, turns to see this lion of Judah and discovers the lamb having been slain. Here we see it is the lamb that opens the seals. He is the one that breaks open the book. He is the only one worthy. He is the only one who can usher forth future world history. He is the only one worthy to unfold God's cataclysmic judgments against sinful mankind. He is worthy, according to verse 9 of chapter 5, because he was slain. And he purchased for God with his blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What is the connection? Jesus is the man whom God has appointed to judge the world. He is the God-man who will sit on his glorious throne and divide the nations and separate them out and assess the human heart, assess the outward activities and the inward motives. He's the one who will hold account every careless word. Jesus is the judge of mankind because he himself was judged for sin. He went to the cross to bear away every sin, past, present, and future, of everyone who would belong to him, everyone who would believe the gospel. And he rightly is the one who will judge the unrepentant world for its sin. Jesus alone knows what it means to come under the infinite weight of the glory of his Father's justice. And Jesus himself will wield that justice one day against a recalcitrant world. John records, I heard one of the four living beings, those four living creatures surrounding the throne, say, come. And they're not speaking to the readers. They're not speaking to John, the apostle. These four living beings are commanding the judgment to come forth. They're commanding the first rider on a horse. These four living beings are connected to the throne. At the center of the throne room, they execute the will of the one who sits on the throne And notice the voice of this first living being is foreboding. I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, a storm is coming. And look at verse 2. This directive from the four living being is obeyed. Behold, John says, a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow. A crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. What do we see here in verse 2? This first horseman of the apocalypse is, it's a white horse and the rider on it has uh, the weapon of warfare and he has a crown on his head. If you fast forward in the book of Revelation to chapter 19, you see a a rider on a white horse who has come to make war and it might be tempting to think, oh, this is the same. A, A white horse with a rider making war against the earth in two different places. It must be the same person. It's not the same person. The rider on the white horse in Revelation 19 is the Lord Jesus Christ himself coming personally to the earth. This happens before that time. Jesus is the one who breaks open the seal and the living beings are not calling Jesus to come forth. They are calling this judgment to come forth, a judgment personified as a rider on a white horse with a crown and a bow. White horses were often used as uh, the, the war horses as an emblem of military victory. They were used in parades for the victorious armies. And in the book of Revelation, white is regularly the color of righteousness. This is interesting. This seems clean and white and right. 
And this one wears a crown. He is victorious. But all of this is an imitation. This is not a genuine righteousness. That is not the gleaming white brightness of God's justice personified. This looks like a good thing. By the way, the book of Revelation is full of these imitations. Later on, we'll discover a beast who has two horns like a lamb, and yet he speaks like a dragon. There's a lot of Jesus imitation in this book. This rider on a white horse is, is not bringing real righteousness, though it looks good to the world for a moment. The text tells us he has a bow. A bow is an implement of war. This rider is signaling war. But notice he has no sword, he has no spear. The sword, the spear, and the bow are often this trifecta of war implements in your Bible. Uh, the bow was used for long range, far off war, and the threat of conflict. Uh, the spear for a little closer range, and then various shapes and sizes of swords for hand fighting. He has only a bow, and he has no arrows. I think this is indicating something of a bloodless conquest. He goes out conquering and to conquer, the text tells us. He seeks to subjugate people after people across the earth. And he is given a crown, the victor's wreath. And he's given this crown even before he conquers. This is a movement toward a worldwide peace. A rider on a white horse, winning victories without firing a shot, getting everybody together under his rule. This sounds like hope at last, does it not? I mean, if we just get together, if we can all speak the same language, think of the things that we can build together. And what will unfold in the book of Revelation begins to resemble very quickly an old history of mankind. Back to Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. What could man do with all of his abilities and capabilities if they can just work together and speak the same language? That did not end well. The peace described in this verse is a coerced peace. It is like the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana. It is that peace by force. All will be subject to the Roman Empire or else. And of course, from the book of Daniel, we understand that there, in this time period, this future time period, there will be a resurrection of the Roman way. This is not freedom for everybody and a kumbaya getting together. We're not singing old Beatles tunes. This is totalitarian. He is a conqueror. And the bloodless victory, the peace won, is superficial. It's a thin veneer and it is short-lived. If you've ever baked a cake badly, you, know, you left it in the oven too, wrong, uh, too long or you got the ingredients mixed up a little bit and, and the cake cracks, maybe you try to do a two-layer or a three-layer thing and then there's cracks all the way through and it's barely holding together and maybe you're running toothpicks through it to try to hold the pieces together and what do you do to cover it all up? Lots of frosting. In terms of cakes, it's a disaster. And the covering is, is phony. It's, it's covering up the deep cracks that are, that are fissures in the realm of humanity. You think about this today in our own world. We, we can see vestiges of this in our day. With, with mass migration movements, people with different cultural values, different worldviews are getting together. And they're not amalgamating. They're aggregating. They're not coming in to be a, a melting pot and learn the ethos and the language of the place they're moving to. They want to uphold the values that they had in the new place that they live. And it might look good on paper and sound like a great idea. And the reality is it produces conflict. There is drama coming to our world. There is a radical polarization in our own culture today. It is a volatile chemical mixture that could blow at any moment. Notice in this text it was given. 
it was given to the one sitting on the horse to conquer. This is one of those divine passives in your Bible. The one conducting all of this is not named, but it is God who is in charge. There are evil forces here, and they are operating according to evil intent, but they are all under divine decree. The human race will be allowed to run as it would, to run headlong into its own self-destruction. And all of this is part of God's judgment against a rebellious world. A world that stiff arms God and says, I'm going to do it my way, and God one day will say, do it your way. There's a second rider on a second horse, the second seal in verse 3. This is a rider on a fiery red horse. And this symbolizes warfare. When Jesus broke the second seal, verse 3, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, and another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. In verse 3, Jesus breaks the second seal. The second living creature issues the command, Come, and the second judgment obeys the summons from the throne of heaven. And the second judgment is portrayed as a rider on a fiery red horse. This again is a dramatized depiction of an awful reality. And notice in this seal, John does not say, I looked and behold, like he did with horse one and horse three and horse four. This one's different. In other words, the rider on the first horse and the rider on the second horse seem to go together grammatically. In fact, he uses the word another. This word for another here is another of the same kind. They come at different times, one succeeding after the other, but with very different effects. One of the reasons we know that the rider on the white horse, the the white horse with the crown of victory conquering was a was a a reign of, of peace, coerced though it was, is because in this second judgment, the peace on the earth is taken away. People might have said for a few moments, hey, we finally arrived, we're all together, and there's no war anywhere. As all succumbed to the rider on the first horse. But now we have fiery red on the horse. It's the color of blood, bloodshed, and war. And we read that it was given to him to, make, to take peace from the earth. Again, this is God's direction. This is humanity's evil. God is giving mankind over to his own capabilities. The bloodless conquest of the rider on the white horse gives way to the worst worldwide warfare that history will have ever known. To take peace from the earth is to open the floodgates of hatred, violence, vengeance, brutality, and murder. What we saw on October 7th in Israel and the rampage of horrors there will occur on a global scale. And notice the next half of verse 6. Men would slay one another. This is not the, the fighting of nationalities, though that happens during this judgment. But this one's a little closer to home. The word here for slay is the word slaughter. It's the word used in, in the butchering of animals. And, and it's not just international fighting here, Axis versus allies, good guys versus bad guys on the world stage. This is internal strife. It's not merely nationalism fighting over borders. It's not manifest destiny trying to get new territory. In our day, nationalism has become the bad word, like it's a bad thing to have a nation, to have borders, to have laws unique to various lands, different ways of doing things. But listen, the the world is being prepped for a global mindset, and it will not prevent war. Nations will still do battle with each other, and even worse... People will fight each other internally, civil war and internal strife. You think about all the world's attempts at war prevention, peace through superior firepower and an arms race, treaties, accords, alliances. In medieval Europe, it was intermarriages. You know, if I can marry off one of my kids to the daughter of 
my enemy, then maybe we won't fight for a couple generations. That didn't work very well. In our day, economic codependencies are an attempt by some to prevent war. If we, if we need each other economically, we're less likely to have a world war. You think about all the government attempts at preventing violence in-house. Listen, there will be no way to police this when this goes down. There will be abject anarchy and brutal civil strife. We've seen it in the last few years. It does not take much to set a city on fire these days. And every city on the earth will be brutalized by person-to-person violence. In fact, Jesus described this period this way. The love of many will grow cold. Family members will hate family members. The, the closest natural ties will be broken down. Do you remember COVID? And the selfishness at Costco? <laughs> Over water bottles and a pallet of toilet paper. Do you remember the shootings at the Walmart over consumer goods? Listen, war is bad. But what will the world be like when anarchy erupts? When unstoppable open season violence is everywhere on display? And who could stop it? Nowhere will be safe. It will be man versus man in every corner. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2.6 that a day is coming when the restrainer will be removed. I know there's debate about the identity of the restrainer. I believe that is the presence of the Holy Spirit removed from the earth who has a hand in restraining the capabilities of man. We're not everything we could be yet. But there's a day coming when he will leave and man will reach his potential. What does mankind look like when left alone? when the restrainer is removed, when police are incapacitated, when the law breaks down and civil order is gone, it is not a pretty picture. And this is the judgment of God. You might ask the question, where is the humanity? This is the humanity. We use the word humane as an adjective to describe the way we should treat people like it's an equal sign with the golden rule. (laughs) You let man do what he is capable of according to his heart and you end up in this seal judgment. The lament will be the same as the ending of Joseph Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness. Oh, the humanity When man is left to his own devices, how bad will it get? As bad as we could imagine. And it gets worse. Number three, we have a rider on a black horse. And this black horse here is the emblem of famine. Look at verse five. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Black here is the picture of lament, mourning, and sadness. Jesus opens the third seal, the third living being utters the command, and the judgment unfolds. The rider on the black horse is a dramatic representation of global famine, We have seen regional scarcity. We've seen supply chain breakdowns, temporary shortages of goods. But this third seal judgment entails a worldwide lack of basic necessities. Black, again, is the color of mourning and sorrow. There will be a global sorrow of the trial the world faces during this time. The pair of scales here is a a long bar with either a weight and a pan or two pans on either side to compare weights. And and throughout Scripture, scales for foodstuffs were a metaphor for scarcity. Scales became the symbol of, hey, there's not enough to go around, so we have to measure very carefully all the portions. 
A voice comes out of the middle of the four living beings in verse 6. The voice essentially says famine. I believe this is the the voice of, of God the Father coming from the throne. And the voice says, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. Don't damage the oil and the wine. What does that mean? A denarius was one day's wage. What you would earn in a day as a day laborer or as a Roman soldier. And one measure of wheat was sustenance for one person for one day. So imagine that for a moment. Your entire day's wage goes to enough food to supply you for one day. One ration. Or three measures of barley for one day's wage. That way you could feed three persons, but barley was a less nutritious foodstuff than wheat. People have tried to make measurements of of how did this compare to the normal price. I've seen a range of 10 to 12 times the normal cost. That's what's at stake here. The price of wheat, the price of barley, just increased by 10 to 12 fold. In other words, the prices of basic commodities are massively inflated. That's why you have the scales. Everything has to be measured very carefully. Have you seen footage of a bag of rice showing up in a place that has no food? It's being unloaded from the truck. And then guys with machine guns show up and steal it away. Greed, selfishness, survival instinct, violence, bloodshed. Over the basics we take for granted every single day. Can you imagine? I don't know how many people will still be earning a day's wage at this point. To even buy a day's supply of food. The shortage we global. The global conquest from the first horsemen will be a shakeup of every political and societal structure followed right on its heels by global warfare between nations and man to man so who's growing crops who's maintaining the supply chain there will be mass starvation with one day's wage for one ration you can't feed dependents you can't feed the infirm you can't feed the young and the old this is a global catastrophe What about this last section? Don't hurt the oil and the wine. They must be protected. Oil and wine were fairly normal commodities in the ancient Near East. These were normal comfort items. They've now become luxuries. Everybody used oil and wine, but you didn't necessarily need them to survive. They weren't the bare subsistence necessities. They were a comfort item. Now there are still stores of oil and wine. There are stashes of them, but they are available only to the rich and the powerful and the well-connected. They have access to them. So the call goes out, don't hurt it. Keep it protected. And so you have here the disparity between the privileged and the poor growing exponentially. Those with reserves can afford to pay 12 times the cost of wheat. And they still have their stores of oil and wine. This is a little comfort for the wealthy, a little comfort for the powerful, a little comfort for the connected, while those normal comforts of life are way beyond the reach of the 99%. Don't think that the one percenters are off the hook for long. You can skip ahead to verse 15. The kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, the rich and the strong And every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. The wrath of the Lamb has come. Whatever they were able to prepare and store up for themselves will not last long. The severity steps up with the fourth horse and its rider. Verse 7. When the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. And I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine, with pestilence, and with the wild beasts of the earth. Jesus opens the seventh seal. 
or excuse me, the fourth seal in verse 7. The fourth living being issues the command, come, which is obeyed by the fourth rider on a horse. The horse here is ashen, according to the New American Standard. Uh, it is a pale green, a pallid, sickly green. It is the yellow-gray green that marks decay. It's the color of a corpse. One writer poetically called it a cadaverous hue. The one seated on the pale green horse has a name. His name is Death. This is the only rider named of the four horsemen. Death here has a companion, a a trailer if you will. His name is Hades. He's following after him. You, You can think of Hades like a hearse. And back in the old days of horse-drawn carriages, the hearse would follow after the horses. Death comes, and then Hades scoops up the victims. That's the picture here. Death comes for the living. Hades comes for the dead. What is death? Death is a separation of body and soul. It is the disintegration of your material outward self and your immaterial inward soul. And what is Hades? Hades is the place that holds the souls of the wicked dead. Those who await the resurrection and final judgment. Hades is something of a holding tank for the immaterial portion of those who do not believe the gospel. What is resurrection? Resurrection is the reintegration of body and soul. It's the reconnecting of the immaterial you with a material body fit to last forever. And both believers and unbelievers will experience a resurrection. There's a first kind of resurrection that's good and a second kind of resurrection that leads only to judgment. Here in this verse, death and Hades are personified. They are personified traversing the earth to kill men on the face of the earth and to remove them to the temporary judgment of the unseen realm. And notice the text again, verse 8, says that authority was given to them. This is another divine passive. Who gave the authority to death and to Hades to kill a fourth of mankind? God does this. This is His judgment. And while death is an enemy, that enemy is employed by God to accomplish His purpose of judging an unrepentant world. There is no evil power that is bigger than God or stronger than God that can threaten the outcome of history. Every evil power, including death itself, is on a short leash with God and only goes as far as God allows. Every evil will be dealt with personally by God and fully. At the worst period of world history, even here, we see death and Hades on a short leash under the hand of a sovereign God. If you're tempted to think when you pick up the newspaper that your world is out of control, no, it is not. God is still sovereign. They are given authority, the text tells us, to kill a fourth of the earth. We don't know how many people will be alive at that time. Today's population is 8.1 billion. If 8 billion people lived on the earth, you're talking about 2 billion dead in one judgment. This is stunning. This quarter of the earth is not regional. It's not like God picks one continent and kills everybody there. This is distributed throughout the earth as all of these judgments entail the nations and are experienced worldwide. And then four implements of mass casualty are listed. Sword, famine, pestilence, wild beasts. The sword is more violence on top of what has already occurred. Nothing in history compares to the violence that will ensue. And then famine, again, more starvation. After all that we've already seen in the first three riders on horses, uh, agricultural and, and supply chain technologies will have come to an end. There would be a complete breakdown of these things. And when people don't eat well, disease spreads. There will be pestilence that takes many. This is epidemic disease the world will face. It's often the consequence and the aftermath of war and starvation. In our recent history, we think about COVID-19 that went around the world and, and took people off the earth. 
Throughout history, there have been the Black Plague and the Black Death. And in the late 200s AD, a pestilence went through Rome that killed 5,000 a day in the city. This fourth seal, worldwide pestilence, will wipe out people everywhere in a way that has not been seen on the earth yet. And then the wild beasts. I, I should not have been reading this chapter when I was a kid. I lived in Alaska and there were wild beasts up there. I have on my bedside table a book titled Alaska Bear Tales. Every once in a while I open it up and I read one more story of some guy getting mauled by a grizzly bear. I'm not recommending that. Some of you have those kinds of thoughts about great white sharks. What will it be like when the environment turns on its master? If humanity was designed to be Lord of the earth, what will it look like when the earth strikes back? Shamu turned on its trainer. Lions eat their tamers. The zoos go crazy. And with all the things going on with humanity at that time, the, the beasts of the forests and the fields will find their way to human populations and eat people. Worldwide terror by the jaws and tusks and hooves of the world's wild animals. One author described the activities of this fourth rider on the horse this way, the unsheathed sword in the hands of the remorseless rider will not be withdrawn till its divinely appointed task is finished. In Revelation chapter 20, we will see death and Hades personified again. What will be their fate? This is comforting. Verse 14. Death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. What dies? Death dies. At the point when the universe in its present form is dissolved by fire, after the great white throne judgment, before the creation of a new heavens and new earth, death itself dies. And Hades goes away. There's no more need for a holding tank for the separation between material and immaterial. There's a message here for preppers. If you're storing sacks of wheat in between the drywall in your home, it won't work. If you're storing up ammunition in your basement, it will not save you. If you're collecting MREs and pallets of toilet paper, They will be of no help. For you apocalyptic savers, you can stockpile cash, you can diversify your portfolio, you can buy gold now. And it will not help you. Could you hedge your investments? Is there some way to protect against ten times inflation or against war or famine or pestilence? There's a whole group of people that have moved out to the the rugged wilds of Montana and Idaho to try to get away for the apocalypse that's coming. They'll be eaten by the animals. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to escape this. This is God's judgment against the earth. It is His judgment. It is intentional. It is pervasive. And He will win. Listen, the only protection for you from this awful period of God's coming judgment is the gospel. You find your refuge in Jesus Christ now because judgment is coming. As we read in the book of Revelation, we will discover there will be people who find God's mercy during that period. I'm not recommending that you wait until then. Besides, there's no guarantee that if you stiff-arm God now with the knowledge that you have, that He won't just give you over to your willful ignorance and rebellion. The intensity only increases from here. The period of the four horsemen, these first four seals, part of the first seven seals of judgment, Jesus called this period the beginning of birth pangs. It's not yet the great tribulation. 
It will only get worse from here. What do we do with this? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will not be present during this time. Therefore, it's irrelevant and you don't have to think about it. No. Why is it here? Why is this recorded for us? I think we need to be stirred up a little bit. Let me give you some therefores. First of all, consider for what you are living. What are you living for? What are your future plans? What are you aiming at? For a world that will burn? Or are you living for the Lord who will save? This text, this scene, these chapters force introspection. Am I stockpiling that which will burn? Secondly, hold your plans loosely. Hold your plans loosely. It, it's good to make plans, but know that they're all contingent. If the Lord allows the world to spin the way it has been for a long time, one more day, those plans, planning ahead things, the vacation you've got in store, the, the career you're intending to pursue, the education. Listen, don't drop out of elementary school. <laughs> it's good to plan ahead, but we hold them loosely, don't we? Make your predictions reverently. There's a third therefore. We'll go here. We'll do this. What does James tell us? Say, if the Lord wills, we'll go here and do this. He is sovereign over all things. God makes a business out of laying low human pride. And sometimes that pride manifests itself in just our deciding to be in charge. I make my calendar, I run the show, I do what I'm going to do. And the Bible tells us, if the Lord wills. How many times have natural disasters, financial crises, illness, injury, or death interrupted our well-laid plans? Listen, regular interruptions of our plans are levelers of our pride. And someday, at some point, God will bring every human plan to a standstill. Fourthly, invest where it counts. Earthly dollars buy eternal treasures. And earthly moments trade for eternal joys. How do you spend your resources? Money, that's part of it. Time, opportunities, relationship, education. All of this is a stewardship before the Lord. Do you remember Jesus' parables about readiness for the master's return? Who is the good and faithful slave about his father's business? Are you looking up? Eager for the return of Christ? and letting that govern where and how you invest. Fifth, the end is near. I think we should all walk out of here wearing that sandwich board at the football game. <laughs> it's true. Listen to 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, love one another deeply. Love covers a multitude of sins. Those are specific applications of scary eschatology. <laughs> Lastly, consider what these judgments of God are. Fundamentally, this is God giving the world over to what the world wants. What does the world want? Godlessness. God, stop bothering me. Let me live the way I want. I don't want my conscience burdened. I don't want your rights and wrongs. I don't want somebody telling me what to do. I want it my way. These judgments are God in an ultimate sense giving mankind over to what mankind desires and what mankind is capable of. You might be here this morning and being tempted to think, I just want to live my, wife, my life the way I want. I don't want religion to pester me. I, I, I don't want somebody telling me what to do. I don't need to order my life around some God somewhere. 
You live that way now and you may get exactly what you're asking for. For the restrainer to go away. For all of God's kindnesses and gracious gifts that you've experienced every day of your life on this earth to be retracted. And for you to be left only with your railing against him. God will judge. The judge of the earth will do what is right. And if you don't know Christ, you need to turn to him and find refuge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this warning, this forecast, this accurate depiction of the world's future history. We confess that at so many levels, we just don't believe this. We don't often live like this is true. We who know and love the gospel are so easily distracted by temporal things. We so quickly lose compassion for those around us who are perishing. Oh God, make us quick with the gospel on our lips and our feet shod with the readiness of sprinting with the gospel to the ends of the earth, of taking the gospel to the rooms in our home, of taking your good news to the people we know at work and at school, to our neighbors. May we live in light of this future history. We pray, O oh God, to be changed. We know the time is near. In Jesus' name.